I can remember a lecture that was given probably some 55 years ago. That was the chapter we read, Ezekiel 38. We've been reading it ever since. It's a chapter which has excited more Christadelphians probably than almost any other chapter in the Bible because it talks about the days in which we live. And I can remember the place, it was uh, in Toronto. It was an old, uh, it was called the Palace Pier. Actually, it was a pier. It was built upon stilts in Lake Ontario. And uh, we used to pack in uh, several hundred people into that gathering. And I remember this brother, an older brother, who could remember back when Israel became a state and he was still very excited about it and he wanted everyone to share his excitement. And we went, we always went home from those gatherings, strengthened and encouraged that what was going on in the world was actually foretold in God's word. There were exciting times and it's, it's never been anything different. Because although we haven't seen exactly what we were expecting, we have certainly got a lot closer. And so what granddad was saying to me about the coming of the Lord and what my dad said to me, what we have said to our children, what our children are saying to our grandchildren, is that the Lord is coming. And in many, many cases, it's because of what that chapter, Ezekiel 38, has had to say. But when we look at a map of Europe and we think about what that chapter has to say, there's a number of things which must happen yet. But this is the reason why we are excited about it, because we happen to live in the days, like the older brother said to me, the days when Israel is back in the land. And Joel chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 says, Behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So it was exciting to think that if God had brought the people back to the land, and in those early days, we didn't see that freedom of Jerusalem, but we have seen it since. But the next thing was to gather all the nations. So when we look at a map of Europe and we look at what Ezekiel 38 has to say, we expect these things to be happening. God's working to gather the nations to bring them to Jerusalem, to deal with them there as he has said by his prophets. And in Ezekiel 38 itself, verse 8 where it states either in the King James or in a modern version like the ESV, the same thing. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, gathered out of many people, against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it's brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So it's that link which makes our study in Europe and Russia so significant, that Israel is back in the land, and we look forward to the time of these events, whether we will see all of them, we don't know, but certainly we are seeing some of them. And it's not as if it, it was just left to read a modern version that would say some of the the people that we actually see in the world today, because we know our strength in this is in the nations and the divisions that God could see back in Genesis chapter 10. And that's the wonder of the Bible, that things that were written so long ago, it's not centuries, it's millenniums ago, could be fulfilled in our day. A very, a very tremendous privilege to be alive and to see these things. So we've noticed in Genesis 10, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Tubal, Meshach, Gomer, Togarmah. All these are nations which are expressed in Ezekiel 38. And that, that is just falling on deaf ears for people who don't read their Bibles. They don't see the connection. If they knew about Ezekiel 38 and they didn't know about Genesis 10, they wouldn't know who God was speaking about. But we can see it. And when we consult 
these old maps, we can find out that it's, it's not just Christadelphians saying this, it's people who've studied history and can see that these were the, these were the sons of, uh, or this is where the sons of Japheth went. So whether you look at Gomer or Magog, you note the little, the little part on the map at the top here where it talks about the descendants of Gomer occupied probably Germany, France, Spain, and the British Isles. So when we talk about Europe, we're talking about Gomer, we're talking about Magog, we're talking about Togarma, we're talking about Meshach and Tubal and Rosh. And those are the things which excite us about what we see happening in the world. But it's, it's not just that. Like if we would miss it if we just saw the record. Because if, if we ever get into the idea of just watching the news to see what's happening and, and expecting that all of this will somehow just be pointed out to us in the world and, and by the media, that's, that's not going to happen. Because you can see in Ezekiel 38 verse 4 that God says, I will turn thee back. So apart from however God does that, by what nation or by what circumstances he does that or has done that, we must note that God says, I will do this. God is bringing these things to come to pass. It's not just watching and seeing, and hopefully history will work out this way. It's because God has said this, distinctly said this in all the records, that he does this. I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen. If you go to Daniel 2, verse 44, you get the same idea. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. It's not just that this happens. It's that God does it. He will set up a kingdom, and this kingdom will never be destroyed. This kingdom will not be left to other people. But it will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And again, brothers and sisters, it's, it's not as if you know, there's, there's some vague idea of God out there. It's that we have come to know our God, Yahweh. And we know how often in the scriptures, when God says he's going to do something, he relates it to his name. And that wonderful work that we have inherited from our forefathers who did the work on God manifestation and told us through this book, Phanerosis, the various meanings and titles of deity. So that when God does something, he tells us he will do it, and it's just associated with his name. Yahweh will gather all the nations. Well, Zechariah 14 says, Behold, the day of Yahweh cometh, thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the point of, of drawing your attention again to these well-known prophecies is just to see how many times we see that God says he will intervene to do it. So all the writers of all the newspapers and all the media writers there are out there may have their thoughts and their ideas of how this will come to pass. We don't know how it will come to pass, but we do know that our God will bring it to pass. We never, ever doubt that. So back to Joel chapter 3. He says that when I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, in those days, in that time, I will also gather all nations. Well, we, of all the generations that have lived since the writing of these things, you go back, this is 2,500 years. Just think of the number of generations of people, not just people, but generations of people who never saw anything like this. We see it. And I think God expects our witness and our testimony to be commensurate with that. We know that when we have sought through the meanings of these titles in uh, King James Version, that modern versions use the word Rosh in the place of chief. And that has led us to understand that this is directing attention to a nation called Russia. Alpha's Israel, uh, page 429, Brother Thomas says, Gog of the land of Magog, that is, styling the ruler of Magog by the latter syllable of the name of the country over which he rules. 
We have seen that Magog is the region extending from the Rhos or Russia to the Rhine, comprehending Walchia, uh, Transvania, uh, Hungary, and Germany. Of course, the prophecy must be future because the prince of, of the Rhos is the Gog of Magog. And as yet, no emperor of Russia has been also emperor of Germany. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Because we could say that today, too. We have not yet seen a prince of Russia who was also the emperor of Germany. So when we see what even our, our uh, brother Thomas is writing, there are things that must yet happen. But it's not just Germany, because it goes on to describe Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters and all his bands, and many people with thee. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them. All of them with shield and helmet. So there's a, a great number of people that must be with this Gog of the land of Magog. Brother Thomas's paraphrase of Ezekiel 38, verses 2 to 7, <clears throat> said this, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the emperor of Germany, Hungary, etc., the autocrat of Russia, Muscovy, and Tobolsky, and prophesy against him and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, autocrat of Russia, Muscovy, and Tobolsky. I will turn thee about and put a hook into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth from the north parts and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them accrued with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, among whom shall be the Persians, Ethiopians, and Libyans, all of them with shields and helmet, French and Italians, Circassians, Cossacks, and the Tartar hordes of Uspek, etc., and many people not particularly named besides. Be thou prepared, prepare thyself, thou, thou and all thy company that are assembled with thee, be thou imperial chief to them. So, Rosh, Ross, Russia, to be prepared, prepare for thyself and all thy company and all that are assembled unto thee, be thou a guard unto them. And they do. And we've seen that in very recent times of how Russia wants to guard its interests in the area of its, its own country. <clears throat> Now, it should be obvious from a map like this, which is not an unusual map to see today, that for Russia to be also the emperor of Germany and to take over and be a guard to all those nations that are mentioned in Ezekiel 38, some pretty significant things have to happen. Because all those blue countries are NATO countries. All those countries would not just immediately fall into the hands of the of the, the Russian leader. But we have learned through history, recently and not so recently, to just never doubt how these things will happen. Like just, there, there, there certainly could be ways we couldn't even conceive of yet how this will happen. Our mind goes back to 1957. <clears throat> and I don't know how many people felt in, us, in Australia, but we sure felt in Canada the feelings that were going through the United States at that time when this little Sputnik craft was going over the United States, as it says in the headlines there, circling the globe at 18,000 miles per hour, tracking four crossings over the U.S. And never had they imagined that Russia would be able to fly something right over their country. And there was a lot of fear. And a lot of people were concerned, very concerned, about what was going to happen in these times. You, you sort of wonder, when people learned about what happens in nuclear war with Nagasaki and Hiroshima, why would you need something that was 100 times greater? And yet bombs were being developed that were huge, able to kill life all over the world many times. It, it was mad, as they said. It was madness. And for those who knew Revelation 16, the sixth vial, it meant something to the Bible student to see the madness that was going on in the 50s and in the 60s. You may remember the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. 
and how this, uh, of every American was just glued to the news when this was going on. And the Russian missile boats were coming. They were going to put these missiles in Cuba right on America's doorstep. And you can see by the little chart there <clears throat> how the Americans planned to thwart their entry into those waters by blockading it with ships and with planes. And the Russian leader Khrushchev decided to turn around and go back. It was a very significant time. This chart is a chart that was made in Adelaide. It was a chart that I used myself in the 60s and I had the, the greatest pleasure, one of the highlights, I would say the highlight of my life when it came to talking about the truth because during the six day war, I had this chart and I was in Brisbane and we were speaking uh, in the, each of the nights, I can't remember it was exactly each of the nights, but it was certainly a number of the nights during the six day, well, it only lasted six days. And we're talking about it and you might remember that at the very part of that six day war, the propaganda that was coming out of the war effort was that Egypt had overrun Israel. And here we are talking about Israel's restoration and what was gonna happen with Ezekiel 38. You think that was exciting? That uh, was exciting because we had to go back to the news and find out how the war was going. And of course, by the third night, we, we learned that it was just the re very reversal of the propaganda. And that Israel actually had gone and, and pretty well taken e Egypt out with that preemptory raid on their airfields. So these are the exciting days in which we live. And that chart is a, is a testimony to the fact that we have not had to change our position, brothers and sisters. What we have been said 50 years ago, what was being written in our literature 100 years ago, is literature that can still be trusted and can still be believed because it was based on what God said he would do, not just based on what people thought would happen or what is happening in the world at the time. It's interesting to look at what we had to say about Russia. Russia advances to world conquest. And these were the terms we used. Increasing communist peril challenges the West because we were dealing with the Soviet Union. We we're dealing with communism. 23 wars against the Reds in 20 years since World War II. Over a thousand million held under communism. Domination of a quarter of the world's land area. 20 year average of a million enslaved each week. Reds believe they will conquer the world in 20 years. Massive stockpiling of terrifying war weapons. The coming re Russian invasion of Israel will plunge all nations into World War III, and there's the chapters we used. So we haven't changed much. And that was the exciting times that we were in in the 60s. And in the 70s, this is a little testimony to the brethren who were continuing to work on proclaiming this message to the world, to try to tell the world that God had, had it all figured out. It was all set out in his word. All we had to read it and, and to believe it. So Brother Maury Stewart, as you can see, that Brother Maury in the center there, this was his set for his television program in California. This is your Bible. And every program, he had that background to it. The land of Magog, Rosh, Tubal, etc. That's what excited people and excited us about the Word of God, is what we were able to say. And, and Brother Purse on, the, on there was his guest that day. Uh, he was being interviewed for what he had to say coming from Australia. It's really interesting how people were quite interested to see that, that we had the same message wherever people came from in the world. And uh, that's never been any different. But then, the Berlin Wall came down. We had been expecting that if Russia was going to take Europe, it was going to be by missiles and bombs. And that's what Russia seemed to want everyone to know, that they could do it. But the Berlin Wall came down, and it came down like that. It came down peacefully. We didn't expect that. And as a result, it cautioned many of us to to read the Word of God carefully and, and say what we had to say in a limited way. We don't know how these things will happen, but we do know God tells us they will happen. And then the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990. 
And this great war machine all of a sudden just seemed to come to a grinding halt. And during that year of 1990, there must have been many Bible students who had believed what we had believed, wondering what was going on in this world. How was this Ezekiel 38 ever going to work its way out in terms of, of the actual countries which were involved? Well, it didn't last long. Because Russia rises again. And for the few people who thought maybe we were wrong prophetically, and that Russia wasn't really in Ezekiel 38, it didn't take long before they started to see this country coming back to life in the same way it was in those early years. We now see this man, Vladimir Putin, president of Russia, a new prince. We don't know whether he would be the prince or not, but he sure has a lot of characteristics like what we expect to, that that person to have. And you can see the way he, he likes to see himself entering the scene. It's, it's, that's the man. That's the character of the man. And just recently, we've seen him at work. We've seen the invasion and takeover of Crimea. We've seen how that he, he would tell the world he wasn't there. There weren't any Russian troops in Crimea when the rest of the world knew that that's exactly what he was doing. You see, it's, it's a deceit of the age. It's, it's the time of, of lying your way through things and trying to win your way through the lack of the truth that we see in major ways in our world. What about this? This airliner blasted out of the sky when the uh, Secretary of State Kerry said, we saw the missile launch, we saw the plane in its trajectory, we saw the missile hit it, we know exactly what, it, what happened because our spy satellites saw the whole thing. Russia claims, Putin claims, they had nothing to do with it. That's the world we live in. That's the character of the new Russia that's rising. Do you think they're prerogative? Well, here's something you may not have, have uh, not been aware of, but back in 2007, a Russian robotic submarine placed a Russian flag under the sea at the North Pole. Well, so that the Russians could claim it was theirs. It's all disputed waters. It's disputed by all those northern nations. Canada is, is always uh, reporting any news with respect to the Arctic because there's so much of the Arctic that's just north of Canada. But it's also north of Alaska. It's also north of Siberia and Norway. And all those nations are looking at this as as the possible place for a lot of resources that they may need in the future. And the cheek of the man, he goes up and he puts a flag under the water, under the ice at the North Pole, it's ours. That's the nature of the rising Russia. July the 4th this month, well, July the 4th is a big celebration for the Americans, but it must have been arranged by the, by the military leaders of Russia whether Putin was involved, I have no idea. But they sent four military aircraft to just show, you know, their excitement over the Americans celebrating July 4th. Came down within just a few miles of California airspace. Four planes like this, bombers, military planes. That's the nature of the man. Now, it does say I will gather all nations against Jerusalem in Zechariah 14, verse 2. So it's not all nations against Rome, not all nations against Paris or any other nation of Europe. It's all nations against Jerusalem. And it's not all nations as if it was all nations in the world, that all nations that are listed on United Nations Charter must come to fulfill this prophecy. No, it's, it's the nations God mentions. He mentions them. He gives us to those nations in the ideas of Ezekiel 38. So some way or another, Russia has got to combine with Europe to come against Jerusalem. So whatever we might see about Russian planes coming to the shores of other countries or influencing Europe, the real thing to watch for is the nations coming against Jerusalem and how Russia might be working to do that. 
I know there'd be many people in Australia here who have, who have come to the city of Jerusalem. It's an amazing thing, amazing city to visit, it's just to walk through the place and to, and to imagine the history from what we've read in the Bible about the place. But it's interesting also to see who are the stakeholders in this city, like who really has interest in this city? Why would the Russians be interested in Jerusalem? Why would Europe be interested in Jerusalem? Why not just leave this to the Middle East or the nations of the Middle East? Well, it's because if you look at the old city, there's a Latin quarter, there's an Arab quarter, there's a Jewish quarter, and there's a Greek quarter. And when you get that in your mind, you start to think, well, what is the Latin Quarter? Like, who's interested in that part of the old city? And this Greek Quarter, who's interested in that part of the old city? I tell you, when you read those things, you start to see the Bible come alive again. You start to see Daniel 7. You start to see Daniel 8. You start to see the fact that there's real old roots here. And these roots are something that these people haven't forgot. You only have to go and look to the east from Jerusalem toward the Mount of Olives and you see this building, the Church of Mary Magdalene, which is Russian real estate in Jerusalem. And when you start to see that yeah, Russia has an interest in Jerusalem and the Latin Quarter, yeah, the nations of Western Europe have an interest in Jerusalem and yeah, the Greek Quarter, the Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, they have an interest in Jerusalem. You start to see... It, Maybe the news haven't caught up with this yet, but certainly the Bible tells us that the interest is in Jerusalem for what is there and how in history it was put there. So we never saw Khrushchev like this. We never saw Brezhnev like this. Putin's different. You wouldn't see those other leaders with church people, but you see Putin like this all the time. Putin's religious links are really quite interesting. So just a, a couple of quotes from some of the snippets files and other files that we've come to, to, to look at and consider. And it says in this, one of the uh, articles in the Forbes magazine, uh, May of this year, when Putin came to power, he shrewdly noted the ROC, now that's the Russian Orthodox Church, the ROC's useful role in boosting nationalism and the fact that it shared his view of Russia's role in the world and began to work towards strengthening the church's role in Russian society. Early in his presidency, the Russian Duma passed a law returning all church property seized during the Soviet era, which alone made the ROC one of the largest landholders in Russia. Over the past decade and a half, <clears throat> Putin has ordered state-owned energy firms to contribute billions to the rebuilding of thousands of churches destroyed under the Soviets, Soviets. And many of those rich oligarchs surrounding him are dedicated supporters of the ROC, which have contributed to the growing influence of the church in myriad ways. Now note this, around 25,000 ROC churches have been built or rebuilt since the early 1990s, the vast majority which have been built during Putin's rule, and largely due to his backing and that of those of his close circle of supporters. So this is new. This is the new Russia. This is the new leader who has seen the way in which the church could support the old, old Russian society could be used in a new Russian society to get him more power and strength than before. Again, <clears throat> this is from a, a later copy of Forbes. Vladimir Putin and Alexander Dugin. Now, <clears throat> now Alexander Dugin is a, an advisor. You might not think that Putin has any advisors. Well, this is one of them. And <clears throat> he has a vision of Holy Russia, which is shared with the, uh, with the Russian Orthodox Church. He sees Russia's mission as being to expand its influence and authority until it dominates the Eurasian landmass by, by means of a strong centralized Russian state aligned with the Russian Orthodox Church, championing 
traditional social values over against the cultural corruption of a libertine West. Now that is really quite a sentence. Because if you've been listening to what this man has been saying, he's been pointing out how weak the West is in championing the original Christian values, as he from time to time points out. And so if this is his vision, that he's going to try to control the Eurasian landmass by means of a strong church associated with him, that's a very different way uh, to bring Russia and Europe together. So you see these edifices that are being built. Beautiful looking things from the artistic point of view or from the architecture. Huge churches that had no place at all in the Soviet era now being reinstated, reinvigorated, reinvigorated. And for those of us who have been around for 20 years or 30 years or 40 years and had looked at, through the Soviet area, we would never have expected this, that a Russian leader in the presence of the Pope would cross himself, would see some semblance to that because of the Pope himself. No, this is, this is the days in which we live. Look at what it says here. This is a, a, a magazine called the Russia Insider and it was January of this year. You may remember Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He was a man who um, became famous in, in getting out of the communist era and uh, has sub subsequently died. But it says in this article, before his death in 2008, Solzhenitsyn praised Putin and stated that he believed Putin's personal acceptance of, Christianity, of the Christian faith to be genuine. American Ambassador William Burns <clears throat> visited Solzhenitsyn April 2008, shortly prior to his death, and quoted him as stating that under Putin, the nation was rediscovering what it was to be Russian and Christian. And then down a little further, it says, while well, initially following the Yeltsin pro-American and pro-Western lead in foreign policy, Putin was also aware that Russia was undergoing a radical transition from a decrepit and collapsed communist state to the recover of some, recovery of some of its older traditions, including a mushrooming, vibrant return to traditional Russian orthodoxy, a faith which he has publicly and personally embraced. So says the press about this man. So it's an interesting thing to follow this. We, we see him doing the things that were done under the provoking uh, during the Cold War years of the Soviet Union, and yet we see him working towards, you know, having counsel from the Pope and giving counsel to the Pope and working with the Russian Orthodox Church. This opens up new ideas. But it's not the only ones, as you may well know, that when we look at European dependence on Russian energy, you can't help but think that Russia and Europe have to come together. The European continent seems to be relying on Russian energy. And as a result, you can see the pipelines that seem to go everywhere, taking Russian energy, either gas or oil, into various ports as, as it is, or various cities around the continent. But this last little piece, um, which we're seeing now, where this pipeline in the south is going to go, it illustrates maybe something new again. We never can be sure this map changes. And it, it changes almost from just the, the times you get the next sip, snippets, which is week to week. But the latest one I saw was this one that showed this pipeline going across the Black Sea, not going into Bulgaria, but going into Turkey, just around Istanbul, going across through Greece, and then going all the way across to Italy. Well, he, he's been talking to people in Italy. He's been talking to people in Greece. He's been talking to people in Turkey. You can see how you know, the strategy is one way or another, they are going to bind Europe to Russia. And that's just another way, which seems to be obvious to the, uh, to the eye who's looking at these things. Well... God says in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8, Wait upon me, saith Yahweh, 
until the day that I rise to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Now it makes you wonder, I'm sure many of you have wondered, how can we appeal to the people of our world about what we know the Bible says, about what we can say has happened according to the Bible's uh, statements about what would happen, and try to interest them into, into looking at these things again. We've had wonderful campaigns in the past of being able to draw people in, but it seems to be that a lot of it falls on deaf ears today. Well, here's one way we've tried in Southern Ontario. We used to make charts on, a, on the floor of a person's house. If they had a big enough floor, we'd lay the cloth out there, someone would get out with their pencils and pencil it all in, and others would come with their paints and they'd paint it all in. It was a very community uh, sort of idea, and it was, a, it was certainly good for working together on these things, but it doesn't have to be done that way at all now. It can be done by somebody with a, a good computer program that will allow you to do that kind of artwork. You send it to the printer, and it comes back on vinyl, all stitched up, ready to go, 12 by 8 chart. Now we took this chart, it, it is 12 feet by 8 feet, and we took it to Gage Park in Hamilton. Now Gage Park is an interesting park. It's about 20 or 30 acres of land down in, not exactly the center of Hamilton, but not very far from it. And Gage is the name of the brother, the brother, who donated it to the city. You go back 100 years or so, it was a Christadelphian who gave that park to the city of Hamilton. Well, probably a good idea. The Christadelphians went back to that park and told people what this man believed. You think that would be a good idea? I think it would be a good idea. Well, this is what we did. With this chart and noting the countries of Ezekiel 38, like we're really working this chapter, look at the flags. So you can see... At the top right-hand corner, you can see Russia, Turkey, France, Germany, Iraq, Libya, Iran. If we want to take all of Gomer, then we could certainly take Portugal and Spain, Italy. We could take all those and put all those flags there. If we wanted to look at the countries which supposedly are governing this world to stop war, we look at, well, the European country, as you see this flag up in this corner here, the, the flag of Europe, the flag of the United Nations, uh, you know, we had to explain uh, to people, why isn't China here? You see, so we used the Chinese flag to explain to them and, and the Vatican flag, the part of the Vatican. And then we could, on the other part, on the uh, right-hand side of the chart, you could talk about Israel and Egypt and Jordan together. And then the bottom, you could talk about the nations, uh, Saudi Arabia, Canada, Britain, Australia, United States, maybe a few others. They're groups of nations. It all comes out of Ezekiel 38. So what we did was we had this big chart and we had a flag stand on this side and a, a flag stand on that side. So we took half of the flags, we put them on, on that side, half of them on this side. Well, when people started seeing their flag, hey, that's my flag, there's the Polish flag or there's the French flag, or there's a, you know, a flag from one of the uh, Middle East countries. And people were attracted, they, they come close to find out why your flag there. So we took a number of young brethren and just said, uh, your job is to go over there at the appropriate time and take out the flag of Saudi Arabia and put it in the center piece here and then tell people why you put that flag there. You put that flag there because this country, Saudi Arabia, we would claim, is mentioned in Ezekiel 38. And Ezekiel 38 is telling people what's happening in the world today. It's explaining it. I tell you, we had a lot of people. I can't tell you about what happened afterwards. Like whether people followed up or not, I don't know. But to create the interest, getting out in public, putting the flags out, really had something to say. This chapter is still the current chapter to be talking to people about. And you can... You can bring in the pieces. If people wanted to know a little bit about it, you don't have to worry about having something written out. You just, just follow what's written on the chart. So you look at these flags. And isn't it, isn't it just really heartwarming that 
after 2,500 years, our generation, you and I, the ones that are alive today, can point out these nations in the world today and say, there's something in the Bible about them. And if you want to know, come on over here. We'll tell you about them. And not only that, but you can draw a line between them and you can say there's two camps there. There's a camp on this side, which means something. There's a camp on that side, which means something. That's what our God has given us so that we can communicate with the people of our day about what his will is and how it is being done in the world. Well, there's a lot of waterways out there and I, I thought, you know, as we've had, a, had an opportunity to visit Istanbul and go over that bridge and just see how important that is to Russia. They got the Black Sea Fleet. They've done all the effort to take over the Crimea, but for what reason? Is there something going on in the Black Sea? Or is it to get out of the Black Sea into the Mediterranean to get into a bigger area? And to go out of the Mediterranean through the Suez to get into another and a bigger ocean? Well, surely that would be one of the reasons. So this little waterway is something to watch. The pipeline, the gas pipeline would be going just to the north of this, going right along that waterway into Greece. It's an interesting thing to watch, brothers and sisters, for what might yet happen in the news. But here's another angle. If you looked at this just from the sake of Wikipedia, now Wikipedia is not you know, the most authentic thing you want to get, but look at what it says about the Crimean War that was fought in 1853, 1853 to 1856. It says the immediate issue involved the rights of Christians in the Holy Land, which was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. It involved the control of the holy sites in and around Jerusalem. The French promoted the rights of Catholics. Russia promoted those of the Orthodox. The longer term causes involved the decline of the Ottoman Empire and the unwillingness of Britain and France to allow Russia to gain territory and power at Ottoman expense. Russia lost and the Ottomans gained a 20 year respite from Russian pressure. The Christians were granted a degree of official equality and the Orthodox gained control of the Christian churches in dispute. Russia survived, gained a new appreciation, appreciation for its religious diversity, and launched a reform program with far-reaching consequences. That's not Christadelphian's writing. That's someone who's looking at what happened in the Crimea War of 1853. Do you think we should be paying attention to what's going on in the Crimea? Well, it seems to me that if we knew this, and knew that it was related to the holy sites around Jerusalem, you would see how God is bringing the nations together to Jerusalem. It's not that we should focus on Europe and Russia, but what they're doing in getting ready for coming to Jerusalem. So look at this. Now, most Christadelphians wouldn't go here because we don't want to go to a church. We wouldn't want to go to Bethlehem necessarily. But you know, Dorothy and I had the chance to do this, and we took the chance to go in there and, and look around. And this building in the forefront you see here is Roman Catholic property. But if you look off to the right, it's the older building, and that's the Orthodox, the Latin, and the Greek. So we went in this building, and, and we were directed to go down into a grotto underneath. So we go down this little dingy tunnel and actually they had a fire down there and it was, it was still dusty and smoky. And we went to this place and there was, a, there was a, a star. Some of you have been down there, no doubt, and have seen that. There's a, there's a silver star there. And, and the man from the Greek Orthodox comes up and says, that's where Jesus was born. Oh, okay. And if you turn around 180 degrees, the Roman Catholics have a little place in the wall where what they called the manger. And they said, but that's where Mary laid him. <laughs> so he was born here, Greek, or Greek Orthodox, and, and you can't have that. You stay away. That's ours. And then the Catholic. That's underground. That's the rivalry between the, the, the one and the other, the Latin and the Greek. Uh, it's still there, very much in evidence. But it's in the mountains of Judah. 
And then you go up to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and that's in Jerusalem. And then you go up to the Church of the Annunciation, and that's in Nazareth. These are the holy sites. This is what they were talking about in the Crimea War, 1853. And these have all been built up. They're all very, you know, plush. And you can see by the architecture and by the new brickwork and that, that they've, they've put a lot of money into this. They still really want these sites. And God says, I'll bring them all to Jerusalem. So why will Russia and Europe come together? Let's just summarize with this last slide. Their coming together is certain because the author of the Bible who knows the future states it will happen. It's not a matter of if, it's not a matter of, of maybe, because, you know, just see how things go. Our God says it will happen. And then to accomplish his purpose with his people of Israel, he will bring them together. Because he's not primarily interested in the Russians or primarily interested in the Europeans. He's primarily interested in his people, Israel. And so he will bring them together to bring them against his people Israel. Europe will have reason, one way or another, to invade the Middle East under Russian leadership. And if you listen to the news or read the news, you will see that echo coming through very often of how they are so anti-Semitic, how they had so much love to see the Jews out of there altogether. So it's, it's coming. But at some stage, they will be attracted to Jerusalem to attempt to take control and to divide the spoil. But all nations, as we have learned from the scriptures, will find Jerusalem to be a burdensome stone, especially for those who rise up against her. Thank you.